We are back for the last week of the quarter, the last week of the month, heading into what could be a tumultuous time in the markets or not. Who knows? We certainly don't. We'll be discussing all of that and more today on Money Never Sleeps. Welcome back, everyone. Before we get going, do us a favor. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the channel. Nothing Kevin or I say is financial advice, so please do your own research for making any buys or sells. Kev, we are back for a shortened week in the markets. TradFi will be closed on Friday for Good Friday, same day that we get some PCE data. Very, very interesting coincidence. Powell also speaking that day. So we get new data. We get no markets, but we do get JPOW. It's going to be uh, quite the time. Not a ton leading up to that. We're going to hear from some Fed governors. We're going to see some housing data. But the main event is Friday with that inflation data. How are you feeling to start the week in the markets? Uh, there's a Lincoln Park song called Numb. Kind of how I feel going into this week, right? This is a week that has pretty low volume trading. We're seeing that today. Uh, the price went to where it was going to be, and then it's been there for the past four hours. Uh, it's been just, I mean, other than the video, but it's its kind of a week where you kind of just let the quarter play out. Um, you might see some selling because obviously as the quarter ends, people might be taking a little bit of profit off the top. We know that we're going to have Q1 earnings coming up soon. So there's a lot of things that are leading into what we're leading into, but it's just not there yet. This is the week that is just kind of boring. Um, obviously, Bitcoin's having some fun today, but I did want to share some things uh, that we could touch on because I think this is one that's really fucking wild. And maybe this is kind of why I feel so numb is this tweet right here. Fed's Powell says he's ready to support job market amid rising unemployment, even if it means higher inflation for Americans. Uh, I sent this to you in house over the weekend. Did you say that? I believe it was we just had FOMC on Wednesday where he said the opposite. Hey man, you know, he's a man of many words. Uh, this is the funniest part too. I'm looking down here, California and 25 other States have triggered the Sam rule, which uh, Sam was, I believe uh, on the, was a fed president at one point, um, not chairman, but one of the fed presidents and Sam rule, which uh, named after her, which she now says is not a role indicating broadening labor market weakness. So California and 25 other states. The funny thing is a bunch of those states are the big cities. So anywhere where there's a lot of uh, jobs to be had, namely manufacturing, also out the window, right? Uh, very different from what we're seeing in the BLS data. So it's very hard to kind of navigate this market when you're getting that type of uh, contradiction. I forget who it was too. Someone recently said that if we were using the metrics of CPI for the year of 2022 and 2023, if it was using the old CPI metrics, we would have been at 18% uh, inflation for those years, given what we were, we know what we had at nine or whatever it was close to 10% given the new calculations. So it's a very much, um, I won't say anything other than that. Uh, you know what it is. It's, it's very hard to navigate this logically, right? Um, so I think that even with prices as high as they are, they could push up a little bit here, but this data and the news that's coming out around it, it seems like everyone's kind of afraid to breathe. And if something bad does happen, it's like, fuck it. Just keep buying, man. That's, that's the, that's the feeling out there. So that's why I feel so numb right now in the markets. But uh, we, we have some logical things that we have to keep in mind because at the end of the day, fraud never uh, pans out. Uh, no, it does not. Eventually it gets what it deserves. All right. What else has been on your radar? I did see today some news out of Boeing with their latest turmoil. CEO is stepping down. Their chairman is stepping down. Their chief of commercial airplanes is stepping down. So Boeing not doing too great. I, uh, I've, I haven't held Boeing stock. I did pick up some Airbus stock within the last month or so. Uh, I think that, you know, there was some value to be had there and I bought it at a good time and I've seen a nice a nice bounce on that. I think it could continue to move upwards, but that's really been my only buy in the markets as of late. I'm not really too interested in being very active at the moment cuz I think that, you know, once again, this is the year where we're going to do less. 
But another thing that is very green today is oil. Wanted to see what your thoughts are when it comes to oil and its broader reaching implications. Like, you know, like how I use broader reaching implications right there. I'm trying to expand my uh, my vocabulary. Hey, this is this is a show of educated men. We use shit and fuck. We don't <laughs> use these nice of, words. This is, a, this is a show of learned doctors right here. Okay? I know. I was, I was trying to say that, but you got the reference. Sorry. Uh, oil rises after Ukraine strikes Russian refineries. Moscow orders output cuts to meet OPEC plus pledge. News came out this morning or whatever time in Russia, U.S., whatever it is, that they are cutting their oil production to 9 million barrels per day, significantly lower. Um, we did see a lot of conflict over the weekends, both in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, when it came to, uh, you know, a lot of bombings and a lot of news that we talked about on Friday, too, with uh, what happened in that concert hall. But there's a lot of news around Russia right now, and it seems like this is kind of strategically hurting. I mean, it's, it's causing the prices to go up in certain things, right? Manufacturing is one of them. The thing is, too, people at the pump, this hurts us as well. And it doesn't seem like it's going to end anytime soon. Like, oil's once again, it's, I think it was like $82 today at one point. Uh, it could slowly be creeping up higher here if this continues to happen. We're seeing everyone around the world just cut oil production. That's problematic because that's what the freaking Fed is using as their metric of inflation, right? This And this is the part that really gets me upset, uh, I think, with what's happening here. it's We're going off of that, but the price of goods, for the most part, has come down significantly, right? I don't think we're ever going to be at the same price we were prior to 2020. And I think that the days of that are long gone. We prayed way too much money. We're going to come down to a point where it's like, okay, maybe they stabilized. And that might be the new low for some goods. But for what they're saying, that inflation is still extremely sticky, but consumer prices are still coming down. I was just telling you before the show too with Target, they're trying to find demand. They're trying to meet that level of where uh, where are the buyers, right? Where are retail investors, not retail investors, but retail you know consumers, they're not necessarily buying higher, which means they probably have less money on hand, which means that we're probably in a disinflationary, almost deflationary period. However, we're still believing a lot of what we're seeing overseas when it comes to oil and these cuts. They're cutting because they need to keep the price of oil up, but there's no demand to pick it up. And if unemployment continues to rise, we're going to see that pullback so hard that's probably going to lead into an absolute recession. So with oil right now, this seems like we're just doing the last squeeze, in my opinion. Um, I think it's also kind of wild because it's not a good thing going into an election to have gasoline extremely high. I was saying that we would probably see oil down extremely low by the time we get to the election. Um, I don't know, guys. Uh, if, it, if it decides to hold out to $100 a barrel, I mean, which is absolutely possible. I mean, we could be seeing extremely high gas prices come election, which I don't think anybody in this country would want if they want to get elected, right? So this is a very, very interesting thing that's complicating how the fed is operating and it's also making it harder for you know banks to issue debt because the rates are going to continue to stay elevated if we're only using oil as the metric it's it's just not a good it's not a good thing will it break at some point it will but right now this is just uh this is kind of bs in my opinion yeah we're not you know we're not that far off from you know, we're about 10 percent, 12 percent away from the highest oil prices we've seen in you know, a couple of years. So all we need is a few more dominoes to fall and they definitely could. What in the crypto world do you want to discuss? There is, you know, we're seeing Bitcoin showing a lot of strength right here. It was down in the you know high 60s, back to almost 71. It got close to 71 just moments ago, uh, but we're still seeing it in the high 70s. If you're looking at the charts and your waves and your patterns and all that mishigash, uh, you know, if we want to speak a little Yiddish here, <laughs> is this purely a, a little bounce because it was oversold or did we did we need that little dip down here recently and now we're back to up only season? It's a mixture of both, and it sucks to say, but it's true, right? Um, and I say up only season, and I think my horizon for what up only season is is a lot more limited to what other people are expecting. But um, just looking at this, you know, I, I would have liked to us to have hit this 60,000 and that's where we bounce off of, right? I want to test it at 50 moving average on the daily. And this is Bitcoin against USD on Coinbase. It's a really good move that we've seen. It's both the stochastic RSI. You know, there's plenty of room to the upside I'm seeing. The other thing is 
even though we've had a really good run up today, this volume is still decreasing, right? That's something we're going to have to keep an eye on to see how that's playing out over the next few days. If this starts to go up, then maybe it's a little bit more organic. If it's not, then uh, so be it. But the other thing I want to pull out, uh, pull up, I shouldn't say pull up, that's so stupid. Uh, pull up is this here. And this is a macro view, right? So this is kind of this... Uh, I guess you can say parallel channel. I'm not going to say a bull flag or a bear flag. It would be if it, if it would have to be one of them, it would be a bull flag. But I mean a bear flag. But uh, we're seeing we're making higher highs and higher lows, right? So I do think that we're getting to a point where if this doesn't, if we're not able to break out of this and continue to close above it, then up only season is a myth. I think that we're going, you know, a lot lower. Where we're going lower probably. Well, I think that by 2025, there's a good chance that we could be testing the bottom of this trend line. And that's just something that, you know, I'm keeping an eye on, right? Coinbase IPO, Bitcoin futures, spot ETF. I mean, we're obviously a lot higher um, than where we were when the ETF came out. A lot of, you know, kind of euphoria, but I also think the conditions are very different than where we were prior to those two things. But I was always talking about that $74,000 level, you know, maybe 74 to 76, maybe 76 is where we go. And that's the fake out. That's kind of like up here. But I do think we're probably going to come up and test this right here at 74 once again. And the interesting thing there is that's like the fourth time that we would be testing it, in, uh, you know, that trend line. And well, if you've only tested the bottom once and you've tested this four times and you can see that everything's extremely overbought on the monthly, the weekly, and they will probably be overbought on the daily. And we're seeing a lot of problems when it comes to currencies, which we'll get into in a second, probably going to be coming down a lot lower. Um, you know, I, I think that naturally we would have to test it. Now, what, what happens once we get here, if we're not able to bounce up from it, maybe this goes on to the next bull run. Maybe we don't go as low as 10,000 as I've been thinking. Maybe we only go to 20,000. Well, then we're probably going to break this at some point. Um, or we invalidate it and we go above it. But the interesting thing is going to be if we do come down to this in, say, a year or so and it doesn't hold, we're probably coming down to that $10,000 level where there's going to be that more of that support because we broke this level. So I'm really interested in seeing how this plays out because this – and again, I'm bringing this up even though it's a macro thing because we're closer to finding out if we're going to break out of this than we are to seeing if we're going to test the bottom. But you don't know if you're going to be able to go for that ride if you don't get rejected off the top of that white trend line. So that's going to be really, really important to watch over the next you know month or so. Um, and again, if it seems like it's possible that we could get there in the next day or two. Um, it, uh, Bitcoin's extremely volatile here too, right? We're up 3,500 today. But then you look at some days back here, you know, we're down 8.4%, 8, 8 $5,000, 5, then up 5,000, up 6,000. Then, you know, down 2,300, down 1,600. We're getting a lot of volatility. And that's something that you kind of want to see. And especially at a, such a pivotal point at the top, volatility, it's kind of a sign that there is a bit of distribution and maybe people are getting out of the market that don't want to be in it. And there's a lot of people that are willing to buy in up here. Um, the question is, if no one else is there to buy from them, then the price is probably going to be pulling back. Yeah, we are on quite the run with Bitcoin here. If we close in the green this month, it'll be seven straight months, which looking back on the history of Bitcoin, there have never been seven straight green months uh, from what I can see here on trading. It only goes back to 2014, but that's, uh, that's a pretty wild win streak we're on at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's completely right. And again, looking at this on the monthly, while the price pushing up, volumes have been decreasing since, uh, you know, so let's say FTX, right? FTX is the last time we had the volumes push up so high. A lot of people trading, buying and selling, mainly selling pressure coming in right here. But the buying pressure hasn't been as much. And that's kind of concerning because, yes, there has been money coming into Bitcoin. But where did what pushed this price up as much as it did? Well, let's talk about what's going on over there at TUSD. And it's funny because I haven't talked about this in a long time. But TUSD, we all know, that's the stable coin that is on the Tron network that. Justin Sun and both CZ were using significantly, right? That was kind of after BUSD was gone, it was TUSD. Now it's FDUSD. A lot of these USDs that are stable coins, I call them unstable coins because look at this. As of recently, we're seeing a lot of volatility in this thing on this peg between USDT and, and uh, true USD. It went as low as, you know, 94 cents back in February and went as high as 115 back in, you know, earlier, just a few, what was it, five days ago. And we could see that it wicked all the way down to, or wicked up today to about 103, 102, almost just short of 103. So we're seeing a lot of volatility with this. And you're kind of wondering, well, why is that happening? 
why are we seeing so much volatility with a stable coin? Well, usually when that happens, it's a matter of liquidity. That's the problem. And we do know that the only two people that kind of use this are the two exchanges, you know, two entities were CZ, meaning Binance was probably using it. Maybe Binance has a bit of a shortfall and they need some money, you know, short term. Uh, I'm not saying shortfall, like their, their books aren't balanced, but there's definitely a possibility that they need some cash and they need to get out of something. They could use that or, you know, Justin's son, just as much who it's on his blockchain, Tron. It's a question that maybe he needs the money it, itself, right? So this is something that I'm going to keep an eye on. It has nothing to be concerned about right now. But when you start to see some stable coins have some problems, and again, the stable coin that at one point was one of the top traded pairs for BTC across all exchanges, we should be concerned somewhat because if there's some problems there and we know how how t uh, how correlated it is with those specific exchanges and specific people, and there is some type of uh, liquidity problem, we could be looking at FTX all over again. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's definitely a thing where maybe Binance does fail. Maybe one of these uh, people who, you know, is very similar to how FTX failed and Solana got hurt by that. We could see something where, say, Binance uh, is a shortfall or TUSD fails and it impacts everything on the Tron network and all of Justin Sun's holdings. He has to sell that for cash. Something like that could absolutely happen. So we have to be careful. This is a really good sign. We're going to watch this as we move forward. But uh, I'd be concerned about stable coins. Keep an eye on those because uh, there's a lot of fishy stuff going on around that lately. All right. You said you wanted to discuss currency. Yeah. Let's, let's, take, let's take that route and then we'll begin to wrap up for the day. Absolutely. Last thing, uh, let me just run through this real quick. That way we can get out of here early today because nothing going on. Uh, Citibank, more layoffs today. Project Bora Bora. Um, obviously, that's not a great sign if the economy is getting stronger. Uh, to add on to that, let's take a look at the S&P. This is kind of this dangerous pattern that we've been watching. It's getting worse, guys. Um, we're getting close to a date where this is going to break. This is this ascending triangle that we've been watching. We broke above it, and now we're in it, and we keep trading and trading. What happens when we get to the apex of this? What happens? We're probably going to be breaking down, right? And where we would break down from, my guess would be as good as yours. Uh, you'd have to find support. And the only place I can find a lot of support is around $4,600, uh, 4,600 points or so. And uh, there's no guarantee that's going to hold. Obviously, the 200 is right there. But there is a good chance that we could see a bit of a sell-off in April. We're st starting to see some of the volatility kind of being picked up on Friday. Someone bought a shit ton of VIX calls. So it's going to be really interesting to see if that plays out. Um, we're going to talk about currency now because that's one that's kind of manipulative just as much as oil is. Let me just pull this up and we look at the dollar. So the dollar closed above a key level on Friday. It was above 104.4. It's pulled back since. And a lot of this is becoming of uh, what happened in uh, Asia recently. So let's look at this. Zoom in so we can just focus on that. This was the big close that we got above it. Then we came back down. We bounced right off it. So as of right now, it's holding a support. We're looking to get that golden cross down here on the 50, crossing the 200. You can see that we're overbought on the daily, but we've also stayed oversold for a period of time. I wouldn't be surprised if we stay overbought for a period of time, and it allows us to build a little bit of momentum to the upside, unless something you know were to absolutely happen that influences the, the dollar's uh, demise a little bit here. We break back underneath this, and we have to test and try and break from later, a later date. But as of right now, I'm still bullish on the dollar. I'm going to see how this plays out. But the problem we were seeing in currency is what's happening with the yuan and the yen. Let me just pull up the yen. If I can find it here. Is this it? Yeah. Here's the yen. So we could see that we had a, uh, it started going up, which is not good. That means that the yen is losing value to the dollar. It shot up as high as about 722. At one point, it was 724, just short of 725, which is not on trading view. So I'm assuming that some other and maybe it was a different exchange or something like that where we actually saw the value this is i believe i sell it might have been on the actual uh hong kong stock exchange but you can see that it wicked up and then the next day this thing bearish engulfing all the way down but we're seeing that it's losing value once again today um with what comes with this so as the currency goes down in uh, international markets, meaning it's uh, gaining value against the dollar, usually the equity markets are selling off. And that's kind of what we saw in China last night, right? See that the Hong the Hang Seng sold off. We see that the, uh, the Shanghai Composite sold off below the 200 EMA. And then we can also see that the CSI, uh, what is this, 1,000? It's testing the 50 moving average. So we're seeing a bit of a sell-off. The other thing is we've been seeing that the yen has been getting extremely weak. A lot of talk regarding... Uh, you know, with the rate hikes and inflation where they might have to rate the hike rates 
a little bit more than they expected, and that's causing the yen to lose value. Thing is, if we look at the Nikkei, you know, it had a good pullback last night, about 474 points. Maybe it's going to fill this gap. Who knows? Maybe there's a little bit more room to the upside. The point is that these central banks are either creating the conditions in which they can have the money to, imp to put into the markets where people are holding up the equity market and that just naturally devalues the currency because people would rather be holding equities as opposed to currency. We also know that import exports are playing a huge uh, you know, role in China's as well, because when it comes to trade, you know, people are going to want to trade in the yuan as opposed to say the peso or the dollar, whichever one they're going through, right? You see that Mexico has been a huge uh, exporter, importer for the United States, but they've been an exporter for, to other nations right now. China's been having problems lately, kind of reason that the yen, sh I mean, the yuan should be losing value. But, uh, you know, we're seeing that these central banks are definitely intervening to try and balance these currencies because once these currencies go, the dollar is going to be ultimately the one that's on top. It doesn't matter if ever, if the U S is in a recession and all these other countries are in a recession, right? The dollar is the world reserve currency. That's what everything is based off of. It's going to be problematic for a lot of these countries. So they don't want to lose the value of these, these dollars for them. Uh, obviously the, the yen right now is just killing their citizens. I'm not, not literally, but it, the value of it, it, the, I know your face is saying it all. I said poor choice of words, Kevin. <laughs> the yen, the yen's value is hurting their purchasing power because they need more yen in order to transact, especially with inflation. The quiet part out loud here, dude. Jesus. <laughs> but uh, it's getting problematic to the point where there's a good chance where if everything does start to go, like again, these economies all decide to go, the dollar is going to be the one that's holding up strong. So they can try and intervene as much as they want right now. No guarantee that uh, it's going to keep the dollar down and equities up. They're trying everything they can, I think, everyone right now to keep equities up. But I'm not convinced that they're going to be able to. Again, I, I say this, but the debt markets are saying something completely different than what the equity markets are saying. And it may take a little bit of time to catch up. But when it does, you know, it's going to be like absolutely nothing you've seen before. I think we're in a very different place in this market as well. Everyone has the ability to trade and everything from their phone. We also know that they're not going through anyone. No one's doing technical analysis anymore. Everyone's kind of following the machine positioning and seeing where machines are buying, where they're maxed out, where they're selling. We're also seeing that, uh, you know, we're in a place where QE seems to be something that a lot of central banks are willing to do, especially after 2020. It's a good chance that we're not in the place where we're going to see the slow, de, you know, default, the slow demise. It's very possible we just see a massive crash, right? And that's the dangerous thing that we're we're playing with. Uh, I, I showed you that that ascending triangle. The closer we get to that apex, the deeper is probably going to be to the push to the downside. Um, you know, we're in a very dangerous pattern for the S and P, and that goes in line with tech and tech positioning. Seems like a lot of people are getting out of it. Retail's coming in, and I guess where I'm going to end today with you know, what I got to say is this right here. Pretty funny. My normie friend just said to me that when retail comes in, brother, you are retail, which is the truth. Uh, when, once people start saying that and they're not traders and they're not actively engaged in this market, I'm running for the fucking doors. Uh, <laughs> but that's all I got. It's it's kind of a boring week. Had to go over that stuff, but it's definitely important to keep in mind watching how other markets are interacting and how they're intervening with their currency because at some point it's going to get nasty. It is going to get nasty indeed. All right, that is going to wrap it up for today's show. We'll be back tomorrow to recap everything going on in the markets. Randy, House, Leroy, appreciate you joining us today. If you have not yet, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, thing every channel tells you to do. Drop some comments. Share us out on social if you want. Thank you for being here with us, everybody. Stay safe in the markets, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.